page 362, out of school. Dad didn't say anything when we met us in the lobby. We just walked out the doors without saying goodbye, even to the security guard at the reception desk. It was weird leaving the school when everyone was still inside. I wondered what Miles and Henry would think when I didn't come back to class. I hated that I was going to miss P.E. that afternoon. My parents were quiet the whole way back to the house. We live on the Upper East Side, which is about a half-hour drive from Beecher Prep, but it felt like it took forever to get home. I can't believe I got suspended, I said, just as we pulled into the parking garage in our building. It's not your fault, honey, answered Mom. They have it in for us. Melissa, Dad yelled, which surprised Mom a bit. Yes, of course it's his fault. This whole situation is his fault. Julian, what the heck were you thinking, writing notes like that? He was goaded into writing them, answered Mom. We had pulled, a st pulled to a stop inside the garage. The parking garage attendant was waiting for us to get out of the car, but we didn't get out. Dad turned around and looked at me. I'm not saying I think the school handled this right, he said. Two weeks suspension is ridiculous, but Julian, you should know better. I know, I said. It was a mistake, Dad. We all make mistakes, said Mom. Dad turned back around. He looked at Mom. Jansen's right, Melissa. If you keep trying to justify his actions, that's not what I'm doing, Jules. Dad didn't answer right away. Then he said, I told Jansen that we're pulling Julian out of Beecher Prep next year. Mom was literally speechless. It took a second for what he said to hit me. You what? I said. Jules, Mom said slowly. I told Jansen that we'll finish out this year at Beecher Prep. Dad continued calmly, but next year, Julian's going to a different school. I can't believe this, I cried. I love Beecher Prep, Dad. I have friends. Mom! I'm not sending you back to that school, Julian, Dad said firmly. No way am I spending another dime on that school. There are plenty of other great private schools in New York City. Mom! I said. Mom wiped her hand across her face. She shook her head. Don't you think we should have talked about this first, she said to Dad. You don't agree, he countered. She rubbed her forehead with her fingers. No, I do agree, she said softly, nodding. Mom, I screamed. She turned around in her seat. Honey, I think Daddy's right. I can't believe this, I yelled, punching the car seat. They have it in for us, she continued, because we complained about the situation with that boy. But that was your fault, I said through clenched teeth. I didn't I didn't tell you to try to get Augie thrown out of the school. I didn't want you to get Tushman fired. That was you. And I'm sorry for that, sweetheart, she said meekly. Julian, said Dad, your mom did everything she did to try and protect you. It's not her fault you wrote those notes, is it? No, but if she hadn't made such a big stink about everything, I started to say. Julian, do you hear yourself, said Dad. Now you're blaming your mom. Before you were blaming the other boys for writing those notes. I'm starting to wonder if what they were saying is right. Don't you feel any remorse for what you've done? Of course he does, said Mom. Melissa, let him answer for himself, Dad said loudly. No. Okay, I yelled. I'm not sorry. I know everybody thinks I should be all... I, I'm sorry for being mean to Augie. I'm sorry I talked smack about him. I'm sorry I dissed him. But I'm not. So sue me. Before Dad could respond, the garage attendant knocked on the car window. Another car had pulled into the garage and they needed us to get out. Spring I didn't tell anyone about the suspension. When Henry texted me a few days later, asking why I wasn't in school, I told him I had strep throat. That's what we told everyone. It turns out, two weeks suspension isn't so bad, by the way. I spent most of my time at home watching Spongebob reruns and playing Knights of the Old Republic. I was still supposed to be up on my schoolwork, though, so it's not like I totally got to goof off. Miss Rubin dropped by the apartment one afternoon with all my locker stuff, my textbooks, my loose leaf book, and all the assignments I would need to make up. And there was a lot. Everything went really well with social studies and English, but I had so much trouble doing the math homework that mom got me a math tutor. Despite all the time off, I really was excited about going back, or at least I thought I was. The night before my first day back, I had one of my nightmares again. 
Only this time, it wasn't me who looked like Augie. It was everyone else. I should have taken that as a premonition. When I back, got back to school, as soon as I arrived, I could tell something was up. Something was different. The first thing I noticed that no one was really excited about seeing me again. I mean, people said hello and asked me how I was feeling, but no one was like, Dude, I missed you. I would have thought Miles and Henry would be like that, but they weren't. In fact, at lunchtime, they didn't even sit at our usual table. They sat with Amos. So I had to take my tray and find a place to squeeze in at Amos's table, which was kind of humiliating. Then I overheard the three of them talking about hanging out at the playground after school and shooting hoops, but no one asked me to come. The first thing that was weirdest of all, though, was that everyone was being really nice to Augie, like ridiculously nice. It was like I had entered the portal to a different dimension, an alternate universe in which Augie and I had changed places. Suddenly, he was the popular one, and I was the outsider? Right after last period, I pulled Henry over to talk to him. Yo, dude, why is everyone being so nice to the freak all of a sudden? I asked. Oh, um, said Henry, looking around kind of nervously. Yeah, well, people don't really call him that anymore. And then he told me all about the stuff that had gone down at the nature retreat. Basically, what had happened was that Augie and Jack got picked picked on by some 7th grade bullies from another school. Henry, Miles, and Amos had rescued them, got into a fight with the bullies, like with real punches flying, and then they all escaped to a corn maze. It sounded really exciting, and as he was telling me, I got mad all over again that Mr. Tushman had made me miss it. Oh man, I said excitedly. I wish I'd been there. I totally would have creamed those jerks. Wait, which jerks? The 7th graders. Really? He looked puzzled. Though Henry always looked a little puzzled, because, I, I don't know, Julian, I kind of think that if you had been there, we might not have rescued them at all. You probably would have been cheering for the seventh graders. I looked at him like he was an idiot. No, I wouldn't, I said. Seriously, he said, giving me a look. No, I said. Okay, he answered, shrugging. Yo, Henry, are you coming? Amos called out from down the hallway. Look, I gotta go said Henry. Wait, I said. Gotta go. Wanna hang out tomorrow after school? Not sure, he answered, backing away. Uh, text me tonight, and we'll see. As I watched him jog away, I had this terrible feeling in the pit of my stomach. Did he really think I was that awful that I would have been rooting for some seventh graders while they beat up Augie up? Is that what people think of me? That I would have been that much of a Dirt wad? Look, I'm the first one to say I don't like Augie Pullman, but I would never want to see him get beat up or anything. I mean, come on, I'm not a psycho. It really annoyed me that that's what people thought about me. I texted Henry later on. Yo, by the way, I would never have just stood by and let those creeps beat Augie and Jack up, but he never texted me back. Mr. Tushman the last month in school was awful. It's not like anyone was out and out mean to me, but I felt iced out by Amos and Henry and Miles. I just didn't feel popular anymore. No one really ever laughed at my jokes. No one wanted to hang out with me. I felt like I could disappear from the school and nobody would miss me. Meanwhile, Augie was walking down the halls like some cool dude, getting high fived by all the jocks in the upper grades. Whatever. Mr. Tushman called me into his office one day. How's it going, Julian? He asked me. Fine. Did you ever write that apology letter I asked you to write? My dad says I'm leaving the school, so I don't have to write anything, I answered. Oh, he said, nodding. I guess I was hoping you'd want to write, write it on your own. Why? I asked back. Everyone thinks I'm the big dirtbag anyway. What the heck is writing a letter going to accomplish? Julian? L look. I know everyone thinks I'm this unfeeling kid who doesn't feel remorse, I said using air quotes. Julian, said Mr. Tushman. No one, suddenly, I felt like I was about to cry, so I just interrupted him. I'm really late for class and I don't want to get in trouble, so can I please go? Mr. Tushman, Tushman looked sad. He nodded. Then I left his office without looking back. A few days later, we received an official notice from the school telling us that they had withdrawn their, their invitation to re-enroll in the fall. 
I didn't think it mattered, since Dad had told them we weren't going back anyway. But we still hadn't heard from the other schools I had applied to, and if I didn't get into any of them, we had planned on, on my going back to Beecher Prep. But now, that was impossible. Mom and Dad were furious at the school, like crazy mad. Mostly because they had already paid the tuition for the next year in advance, and the school wasn't planning on returning the money. See, that's the thing with private schools. They can kick you out for any reason. Luckily, a few days later, we did find out that I'd gotten into my first choice private school. Not far from where, where I lived. I'd have to wear a uniform, but that was okay. Better than having to go to beach or prep every day. Needless to stay, we skipped the graduation ceremony at the end of the year. After. That is only tears such as men use, said Bangara. Now I know thou art a man, and a man's cub no longer. The jungle is shut indeed to thee henceforward. Let them fall, Mowgli. They are only tears. Rudyard Kipling, The Jungle Book Oh, the wind, the wind is blowing. Through the graves the wind is blowing. Freedom soon will come, then will come from the shadows. Leonard Cohen, The Partisan Page 372, Summer Vacation my parents and I went to Paris in June. The original plan was that we would return to New York in July since I was supposed to go to a rock and roll camp with Henry and Miles. But after everything that happened, I didn't want to do that anymore. My parents decided to let me stay with my grandmother for the rest of the summer. Usually, I hated staying with Grammere, but I was okay about it this time. I knew that after my parents went home, I could spend the entire day in my PJs playing Halo, and Grammere wouldn't care in the least. I could pretty much do whatever I wanted. Grandma wasn't exactly the typical grandma type. No baking cookies for Grandma. No knitting sweaters. She was, as Dad always said, something of a character. Even though she was in her 80s, she dressed like a fashion model. Super glamorous, lots of makeup and perfume, high heels. She never woke up until 2 in the afternoon, and then she'd take at least 2 hours to get dressed. When she was up, she would take me out shopping or to the museum or a fancy restaurant. She wasn't uh, uh, into doing kid stuff, if you know what I mean. She'd never sit through a PG movie with me, for instance, so I ended up seeing a lot of movies that were totally age inappropriate. Mom, I knew, would go completely ballistic if she got wind of some of the movies Grammar took me to see. But Grammar was French and was always saying my parents were too American anyway. Grammar also didn't, ta didn't talk to me like I was a little kid. Even when I was younger, she never used baby words or talked to me the way that grown-ups usually talk to little kids. She used regular words to describe everything. Like if I would say, Je vous faire pipi, meaning I, I, I want to make pipi, she would say, You need to urinate? Go to the laboratory. And she cursed sometimes too. Boy, she could curse. And if I didn't know what a curse word meant, all I had to do was ask her, and she would explain it to me in detail. I can't even tell you some of the words she explained to me. Anyway, I was glad to be away from New York City for the whole summer. I was hoping that I would get all, get all the kids out of my head. Augie, Jack, Summer, Henry, Miles, all of them. If I never saw any of those kids again, seriously, I would be the happiest kid in Paris. Mr. Brown. The only thing I was a little bummed about is that I never got to say goodbye to any of my teachers from Beecher Prep. I really liked some of them. Mr. Brown, my English teacher, was probably my favorite teacher of all time. He had always been really nice to me. I loved writing, and he was really complimentary about it. And I never got to tell him I wasn't coming back to Beecher Prep. At the beginning of the year, Mr. Brown had told all of us that he wanted, to, he wanted us to send him one of our own precepts over the summer. So, one afternoon, while Grammy was sleeping, I started thinking about sending him a precept from Paris. I went to one of the tourist shops down the block and bought a postcard of Gargoyle, one of those at the top of Notre Dame. The first thing I thought when I saw it was that it reminded me of Augie. And then I thought, ugh, why am I still thinking about him? Why do I still see his face wherever I go? I can't wait to start over. And that's when it hit me, my precept. I wrote it down really quick. Sometimes it's good to start over. There, perfect. 
I loved it. I got Mr. Brown's edges from his teacher page on the Beecher Prep website and dropped it in the mail that same day. But then, after I sent it, I realized he wasn't going to understand what it meant. Not really. He didn't have the whole background story about why I was so happy to be leaving Beecher Prep and starting over somewhere new. So I decided to write him an email to tell him everything that had happened last year. I mean, not everything. Dad had specifically told me not to ever tell anyone at the school about the mean stuff I did to Augie, for legal reasons. But I wanted Mr. Brown to know enough that he would understand my precept. I also wanted him to know that I thought he was a great teacher. Mom had told everyone that I wasn't going back to Beecher Prep because we were unhappy with the academics and the teachers. I felt kind of bad about that because I didn't want Mr. Brown to ever think I was unhappy with him. So anyway, I decided to send Mr. Brown an email. To Mr. Brown from Julian regarding my precept. Hi, Mr. Brown. I just sent you my precept in the mail. Sometimes it's good to start over. It's on a postcard of a gargoyle. I wrote this precept because I'm going to a new school in September. I ended up hating Beecher Prep. I didn't like the students, but I did like the teachers. I thought your class was great. So don't don't take my not going back personally. I don't know if you know the whole long story, but basically the reason I'm not going back to Beecher Prep is, well, not to name names, but there was one student I really didn't get along with. Actually, it was two students. You can probably guess who they are because one of them punched me in the mouth. Anyway, these kids were not my favorite people in the world. We started writing mean notes to each other. I repeat, each other. It was a two-way street. But I'm the one who got into trouble for it. Just me. It was so unfair. The truth is, Mr. Tushman had it in for me because my mom was trying to get him fired. Anyone. Anyway, long story short, I got suspended for two weeks for writing notes. No one knows this, though. It's a secret, so please don't tell anyone. The school said it had a zero-tolerance policy against bullying, but I don't think what I did was bullying. My parents got so mad at the school, they decided to enroll me in a different school next year. So yeah, that's the story. I really wish that that student had never come to Beecher Prep. My whole year would have been so much better. I hated having to be in his classes. He gave me nightmares. I would still be going to Beecher Prep if he hadn't been there. It's a bummer. I really like your class, though. You were a great teacher. I wanted you to know that. I thought it was a good. I thought it was good that I hadn't named names, but I figured he'd know who I was talking about. I really didn't expect to hear back from him. But the very next day, when I checked my inbox, there was an email from Mr. Brown. I was so excited. To Julian from Mr. Brown regarding my precept. Hi, Julian. Thanks so much for your email. I'm looking forward to getting the gargoyle postcard. I was sorry to hear you wouldn't be coming back to Beecher Prep. I always thought you were a great student and a gifted writer. By the way, I loved your precept. I agree. Sometimes it's good good to start over. A fresh start gives us the chance to reflect on the past, weigh the things we've done, and apply what we've learned from those things to the future. If we don't examine the past, we don't learn from it. As for the kids you didn't like, I don't think I know who you're talking about. I'm sorry the year didn't turn out to be a happy one for you, but I hope you take a little more time to ask yourself why. Things that happen to us, even the bad stuff, can often teach us a little bit about ourselves. Do you ever wonder why you had such a hard time with these two students? Was it, perhaps, their friendship that bothered you? Were you troubled by Augie's physical appearance? You mentioned that you started having nightmares. Did you ever consider that maybe you were just a little afraid of Augie, Julian? Sometimes fear can make even the nicest kids say and do things they wouldn't ordinarily say or do. Perhaps you should explore these feelings further. In any case, I wish you the best of luck in your new school. Julian, you are a good kid, a natural leader. Just remember to use your leadership for good, huh? Don't forget, always choose kind. I don't know why. I was so so happy to get that email from Mr. Brown. I knew he would understand. I knew he would be understanding. I was so tired of everyone thinking I was the- this demon child. You know, it was obvious that Mr. Brown knew I wasn't. I reread his email like ten times. I was smiling from ear to ear. So, Grandma asked me. She had just woken up and was having her breakfast—a croissant and 
cafe a la delivered from downstairs. I haven't seen you this happy all summer long. What is it that you are reading, mon cher? Oh, I got an email from one of my teachers, I answered. Mr. Brown. From your old school, she asked. I thought they were all bad, those teachers. I thought it was good riddance to all of them. Grammar had a thick French accent that was hard to understand sometimes. What? Good riddance, she repeated. Never mind. I thought the teachers were all stupid. The way she pronounced stupid was funny, like stupid. Not all. Not Mr. Brown, I answered. So, what did he write to make you so happy? Oh, nothing much, I said. It's just, I thought everyone hated me, but now I know Mr. Brown doesn't. Grammar looked at me. Why would everyone hate you, Julian? She asked. You are such a good boy. I don't know, I answered. Read me the email, she said. Oh, Grammar, I started to say. Read, she commanded, pointing her finger at the screen. So I read Mr. Brown's letter aloud to her. Now, Grammar knew a little bit about what had happened at Beecher Prep, but I don't think she knew the whole story. I mean, I think Mom and Dad had told her a version of the story they told everyone else, with maybe a few more details. Grammar knew there were a couple of kids who had made life miserable, for instance, but she didn't know the specifics. She knew I'd gotten punched in the mouth, but she didn't know why. If anything, Grammar probably assumed I had gotten bullied, and that's why I was leaving the school. So, there were parts of Mr. Brown's email she really didn't understand. What, what does he mean? She said, squinting as she tried to read off my screen. Augie's physical appearance. Quiestic West. One of the kids that I didn't like, Augie, he had like this awful facial deformity, I answered. He was really bad. He looked like a gargoyle. Julian, she said. That is not very nice. Sorry. And this boy, he was not sympathetic, she, she asked innocently. Uh, he was not nice to you. Was he a bully? I thought about that. No, he wasn't a bully. So why did you not like him? I shrugged. I don't know. He, was, he just got on my nerves. What do you mean? You don't know, she answered quickly. Your parents told me you were leaving school because of some bullies, no? You got punched in the face, no? Well, yeah, I got punched, but not not by the deformed kid, by his friend. Ah, so his friend was the bully. No, not exactly, I said. I can't say they were bullies, Grammar. I mean, it, it, it wasn't like that. We just didn't get along, that's all. We hated each other. It, it's kind of hard to explain. You kind of had to be there. Here. Let me show you what he looked like. Then maybe you'll understand a little bit better. I mean, not to sound mean, but it was really hard having to look at him every day. He gave me nightmares. I logged on to Facebook and found her class picture and zoomed in on Augie's face so she could see. She put her glasses on to, to and looked at it and spent a long time studying his face on the computer screen. I thought she would react the way Mom, and Mom reacted when she first saw the picture of Augie, but she didn't. She just nodded to herself, and then she closed the laptop. Pretty bad, huh? I said to her. She looked at me. Julian, she said. I think maybe your teacher is right. I think you are afraid of this boy. What? No way, I answered. I'm not afraid of Augie. I mean, I didn't like him. In fact, I kind of hated him, but not because I was afraid of him. Sometimes we hate the things we are afraid of, she said. I made a face like she was talking crazy. She took my hand. I know what it's like to be afraid, Julian, she said, holding her fingers up to my face. There was a little boy that I was afraid of when I was a little girl. Let me guess, I answered, sounding bored. I bet he looked like just like Augie. Grammar shook her head. No, his face was fine. So why were you afraid of him, I asked. I tried to make my voice sound as disinterested as possible, but Grammy ignored my, ignored my bad attitude. She just sat back in her chair, her head slightly tilted, and I could tell by looking into her eyes that she had gone somewhere far away. Grammy's Story I was a very popular girl when I was young, Julian, 
said Grimmer. I had many friends. I had pretty clothes. As you can see, I have always liked pretty clothes. She waved her hands down her sides to make her make sure I noticed her dress. She smiled. I was a frivolous girl, she continued. Spoiled. When the Germans came to France, I hardly took any notice. I knew that some Jewish families in my village were moving away, but my family was so cosmopolitan. My parents were intellectuals. Atheists. We didn't even go to synagogue. She paused here and asked me to bring her a wine glass, which I did. She served herself a full glass and, as she always did, offered me some too. And as I always did, I said, Non, merci. Like I said, uh, Mom would go ballistic if she knew the stuff Grandma did sometimes. There was a boy in my school called, well, they called him Tua Tua, she continued. He was, how do you say the word, a, a crippled? Is that how you say it? I don't think people use that word anymore, Grandma, I said. It's not exactly politically correct, if you know what I mean. She flipped her hand at me. Americans are always coming up with new words we can't say anymore, she said. Allure as well. Tor Tor's legs were deformed from the pol polio. He needed two canes to walk with, and his back was all twisted. I think that's why he was called Torcho, crab. He walked sideways like a crab. I know, it sounds very harsh. Children were meaner in those days. I thought about how I called August the freak behind his back, but at least I never called him that to his face. Grammar continued talking. I have to admit, at first I wasn't into telling me one of her long stories, but I was getting into this one. Tioto was a little thing, a skinny thing. None of us ever talked to him because he made us uncomfortable. He was so different, I never even looked at him. I was afraid of him. Afraid to look at him, to talk to him. Afraid he would accidentally touch me. It was easier to pretend he didn't exist. She took a long sip of wine. One morning, a man came running into our school. I knew him. Everyone did. He was a maquis, a partisan. Do you know what that is? He was against the Germans. He rushed into the school and told the teachers that the Germans were coming to take the, all the Jewish children away. What? What is this? I could not believe what I was hearing. The teachers in the school went around, went around to all the classes and gathered the Jewish children together. We were told to follow the Maquis into the woods. We were going to hide. Hurry, hurry, hurry. I think there were maybe ten of us in all. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Escape. Grammar looked at me to make sure I was listening, which, of course, I was. It was snowing that morning and very cold, and all I could think of was, if I go into the woods, I will ruin my shoes. I was wearing these beautiful new red shoes that Papa had brought me. You see, as I said before, I was a frivolous girl, perhaps even a little stupid. But this is what I was thinking. I did not even stop to think. Well, there, there is my mom and Pop. If the Germans were coming for the Jewish children, had they come for the parents already? This did not occur to me. All I could think about were my beautiful shoes. So instead of following the Maquis into the woods, I snuck away from the group and went to, went to hide inside the bell tower of the school. There were a tiny room up there full of crates and books, and there I hid. I remember thinking I would go home in the afternoon after the Germans came and tell my mom and papa all about it. This is how stupid I was, Julian. I nodded. Couldn't believe I had never heard this story before. And then the Germans came, she said. There was a narrow window in the tower, and I could see them perfectly. I watched them run into the woods after the children. I did not take them very long to find them. They all came back together. The Germans, the children, the Maki soldier. Grimmere paused and blinked a few times, and then she took a deep breath. They, sh they, they shot the Marquis in front of all of the children, she said quietly. He fell so softly, Julian, in the snow. The children cried. They cried as they were led away in the line. One of the teachers, Mademoiselle Petitjean, went with them, even though she was not Jewish. 
she said she would not leave her children. No one ever saw her again, poor thing. By now, Julian, I had awakened from my stupidity. I was not thinking of my red shoes any more. I was thinking of my friends who had been taken away. I was thinking of my parents. I was waiting until it was night, night time so I could go home to them. But not all of the Germans had left. Some had stayed behind, along with the French police. They were searching the school, and then I realized they were looking for me. Yes, for me, and for the one or two other Jewish children who had not gone into the woods. I realized then that my friend Rachel had not been among the Jewish children who were marched away, nor Jacob, a boy from another village who all the girls wanted to marry because he was so handsome. Where were they? They must have been hiding just like I was. Then I heard the creaking, Julian. Up the stairs, I heard footsteps up the stairs coming closer to me. I was so scared. I tried to take myself as small as possible behind the crate and hid my head beneath the blanket. Here, Grammy covered her head with her arms as if to show me she was hiding. And then I heard someone whisper my name, she said. It was not a man's voice. It was a child's voice. Sarah, the voice whispered again. I peeked out from the blanket. Toto, I answered, astonished. I was so surprised, because in all the years I had known him, I didn't think I had ever said a word to him, nor him to me. And yet there he was, calling my name. They will find you here, he said. Follow me. And I did follow him, for by now I was terrified. He led me down the hallway into the chapel of the school, which I had never really been there before. We went to the back of the chapel, where there was a crypt. All this was new to me, Julian, and we crawled through the crypt to the Germans, so the Germans would not see us, through the windows, because they were looking for us still. I heard when they found Rachel. I heard her screaming in the courtyard as they took her away. Poor Rachel. Tuatoa took me down to the basement beneath the crypt. There must have been one hundred steps at least. These were not easy for Tortor, as you can imagine, with his terrible limp and his two canes, but he hopped down the steps two at a time, looking behind him to make sure I was following. Finally, we arrived at a passage. It was so narrow, we had to walk sideways to get through. And then we were in the sewers, Julian, can you imagine? I knew instantly because of the smell, of course. We were knee-deep in refuse. You can imagine the smell so much for my red shoes. We walked all night. I was so cold, Julian. Tortor was such a kind boy, though. He gave me his coat to wear. It was, to this day, the most noble act anyone has ever done for me. He was freezing, too, but he gave his coat to me. I was so ashamed for the way I had treated him. Oh, Julian, I was so ashamed. She covered her mouth with her fingers and swallowed. Then she finished the glass of wine and poured herself another. The sewers led to Danavillier, a small village about 15 kilometers away from Aubervilliers. My mom and papa had always avoided this town because of the smell. The sewers from Paris drained onto the farmland there. We wanted to even eat apples grown in the Danavilliers. But it's, it's where Tortor lived. He took me to his house and we cleaned ourselves by the well. And then Tortor brought me into the barn behind his house. He wrapped me up in a horse blanket and told me to wait. He was going to get his parents. No, I pleaded. Please don't tell them. I was so frightened. I wondered if w when they saw me, they would call my Germ would call the Germans. You know, I had never met them before. But Totor left, and after a few minutes later, he returned with his parents. They looked at me. I must have seemed quite pathetic there, all wet and shivering. The mother, Vivienne, put her arms around me to comfort me. Oh, Julian, that hug was the warmest hug I have ever felt. I cried so hard this woman's arms because I knew then. I knew I would cr I would never cry in my own mamam's arms again. I just knew it in my heart, Julian. And I was right. They had taken my mom that same day, along with all the other Jews in the city. My father, who had been at work, had been warned that the Germans were coming and managed to escape. 
He was smuggled to Switzerland, but it was too late for my mom. She was deported that day to Auschwitz. I never saw her again. My beautiful mom. She took a deep breath here and shook her head.